Yep, our road trips are always DIY. And, uh, you know, Redfish is a really great way to do DIY because you can do it on the down low. You can really, you know, if you want to spend a day and fish with a guide, you should. If you want to save your money and do that, you should because getting out, especially if you're going to fish in um, Louisiana, not so much Florida, but Louisiana, I mean, you want to take a boat ride that's a substantial boat ride way back into those marshes to get your big bulls. That was Jen Ripple sharing some tips for your next DIY redfish fly fishing trip. This is the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Jen Ripple is back on the podcast to provide a killer history lesson on some of the uh, the women who have influenced fly fishing over the last 400 years. We find out who was the first person to match the hatch, how Mary Orvis changed fly distribution, and some of the more recent topics for rim, uh, women in fly fishing, including the uh, bikini effect on social media. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors. The Fly Fishing and Tying Journal has another jam-packed summer edition that's out right now. And you can head over to ftjangler.com right now to support the great stuff Craig and the crew has going over there and grab some great reads for your next fly fishing trip. Gotfishing.com is your trusted source of information with access to the world's best fishing trips. You'll never pay a dime extra for the trip you book and in many cases less than advertised. Find out where Got Fishing could take you by heading over to gotfishing.com today. That's G O T fishing.com or reach them by phone at 208 630 3373. Lots of interesting and fun stuff today. So without further ado, Jen Ripple from dunnmagazine.com. How's it going, Jen? Hey, it's going well. <laughs> thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming back on here. We're. Uh, I was just looking back at it. It was episode sixty, which uh, I think we're close to episode one forty now. So it's been uh, it's been quite a while since we had you on. And I wanted to dig in. I, I read an article recently. Uh, maybe you can remind me what magazine it was in, but it was a great uh, little article on kind of the history of women and going back hundreds of years. Uh, so I want to dig into that. But maybe just give us a little update on what's been going on since we last talked. Yeah, sure. Um, I think that article was in the Fly Fishers International magazine. Oh, that's right. Fly Fisher. Yeah. So anyways, um, but yeah, what's been going on? Well, uh, currently we are uh, growing our online presence because of everything COVID, right? Everything's yeah. closed down. So um, we've been growing our online audience. It's been really good for us, actually, because we started out as a digital magazine and then went to print. And so um, upping our online game has been no problem because that's the platform we were used to using anyways. And our audience is vastly online. Yeah. It's much, much bigger. So, um, so that's been good. You know, everything is kind of slowed down. I've actually, uh, kind of, and maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but enjoyed taking a step back, not traveling as much, not speaking mm-hmm. as much, you know, I rarely would spend uh, a whole week in my own bed and I've been able to do that. So life has been good. <laughs> hmm. That that is kind of the the weird thing about it is that some people, I mean, obviously some people have been hit hard, but I mean, a lot of people, myself included, it, it hasn't really been that you know much of it. And in fact, I feel the same way. It seems like yeah, I mean, it's almost like less people out there. And the weird thing is, you think of that thing over China, right? When it first happened in China, the the air quality in China was right because nobody was driving was the yeah. best it's ever been. So. I mean, it's this weird world, right? And we know it's all going to change. I mean, it's already changed, but it, and it will never be like it was before. But yeah, what, what's your takeaway from all this other than, you know, just the general uh, stuff? Um, you know, as far as like the fly fishing industry or as far as, yeah, you know. Yeah, just, I mean, I guess either way, I was kind of thinking more in general, but yeah, I mean, fly fishing yeah. too, yeah. Oh gosh, well, in general, I'm not sure what to think. Yeah. There's so much out there. Who knows what the reality is behind I it know. all. All I know is that, as a magazine, as a person, I tend to um, err on the side of um, being conservative. So, and not politically standing, but yeah. conservative in I would rather uh, protect myself and others if there's no threat, as opposed to saying, "Oh, what the heck? Nothing is going exactly. on, so I'm just going to go do everything." So, I'm erring on the side of being conservative in that, you know. Yep. And I'm not. A, I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm <laughs> not an infectious disease doctor. So I don't know what's going on out there. All I can do is what I can do in my own little world here. And as far as the fly fishing industry, you know, I mean, we've obviously um, 
done a lot, uh, heard a lot from a lot of the people in the industry and have close ties with a lot of people that work in fly fishing. And, you know, we started a done guide giveaway, a give back that was kind of like highlighting a guide. They went onto our platform, signed up and did nothing but um, just fill out a form and give us their Venmo and their PayPals. And then we've been featuring them once a day, uh, a new guide every day so oh, that cool. people can just, you know, if they feel like, like done gets nothing from it, you know, we just want to say, Hey, here's a guide who's had a hard time through this. They've lost all of their income. If you feel like giving them a dollar, here's their Venmo, you know, that's awesome. and that's just how it is. Yeah. And so we've been doing that. Um, you know, as a way to give back, because obviously as a small magazine whose distribution is now uh, like non-existent at the moment, um, we can't do a lot monetarily for them. I wish I had millions mm-hmm. of dollars so I could just, you know, support them all. But this is just a way that we can give back and help in the way that we can, you know. And so I, yeah. I don't think that our fly fishing industry will look the same as it did before. Obviously, I think that you'll see a lot of... Um, uh, shops that aren't going to be able to open back up and guides who have had to go do something else. And so, you know, it's definitely changed the landscape and I don't take, um, anything for granted. The fact that we have the ability to still have an online platform, even if we can't print a magazine at the moment. And, you know, the reality is, is I don't know going forward, you know, we don't have any ad sales because all of the manufacturers are currently on hold as well. So, you know, whether we print a magazine, um, in the summer or we don't have the ability to print a magazine in the summer. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but it, the way that I look at it as, and I probably shouldn't say this as the owner of this magazine, but I'm an entrepreneur enough to know that, you know, if the magazine does not print going forward, then that's just a small price to pay. You know, as yeah. a magazine, we are, um, I feel like if, you know, the magazine, if all the magazines went away, that fly fishing would still go on. But if all of our guides went away, fly fishing would never, ever, ever be the same. And so, you know, I'm just trying to put things in perspective as a business owner and as an angler, you know, yeah, there are bigger things out there right now. So I love that. I love that. Yeah. That's, I just listened to somebody, I think on another podcast talking about just that the guides and the shops and how there's just no you know, there's nothing else like a fly shop, right? There's nothing out there. There's nothing online. There's nothing even close to going into your local fly shop and talking to a guide. And, you know, so I, I agree. I had Matt Smythe on Absolutely. as well. I'll put a link in the show notes to the episode from AFTA. He talked about, I asked him what was the best thing we could do right now with this thing, you know, with COVID. And he said, he said, you know, just reach out to your guides and go to your shops and support them. And, you know, if you have to buy it, if you can buy a trip in advance, you know what I mean? All that good stuff. So I love that. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. cool. Um, well, good. Well, let's jump into I We got another topic to cover here because, I mean, women in fly fishing is, is always on my mind because, uh, you know, I've talked about it before. But, you know, one of the big things is I've got a couple of little girls that are, you know, growing up fast and I want them to have all the opportunities and I want them to know about the history. So can you talk about this article or may, I don't know if you want to just break down the article, just talk about somewhere on, on the history and what it was all about with women in fly fishing. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, um, I, I speak on the history of women in fly fishing at all different events. And the reason that I started doing this was because when I got into fly fishing, and this has been like 14 years now or so, but when I got into it, I didn't know any other women on the on the water. I didn't see them. I heard that there was another woman in my local fly shop in my area, but I didn't know her, never saw her. And so I thought, well, women must be new to fly mm. fishing. That's That was what I thought when I started. And so Um, For my own sanity, I started doing a little bit of research to see if there were women out there and how long women had been in the sport. And so I, you know, I I looked back and I saw, oh, April Volke, she must obviously be the first woman that's (laughs) done anything in fly fishing. Right. But then as I started to do more research, I realized, wait a second, women have a very strong foundation. They have a strong history. And that gave me the foundation for myself. And, and this is what I tell to others to be to know that you belong in the sport, you belong in a fly shop and you belong in the river. Right. Yeah. So once you understand that foundation, then it's easy to feel empowered on the water as a woman, even though at this point in time we might be a minority. And so. <clears throat> When I started doing this this history lesson, I found, I mean, so, so many women, our sport would not be what it is today if it weren't for the contributions that women have made all along the way. Like, for instance, 
way back in the 15th century, you Hmm. know, Dame Juliana Berners, who wrote the first book on fly fishing, A Treatise of Fishing with an Angle. And this is a really interesting small book, and I have Hmm. two different editions of it, which when I give my talk, I pass around all these different things so people can actually feel them and see them and smell them and, you know, all that stuff. Um, But this book is really fascinating. So Dame Juliana Berners was a nun of noble birth, and so she um, started she was she's very well known for a book on hawking. And then she wrote this treatise of fishing with an angle, which is a very small, concise book that tells you everything you need to know. Like, for instance, how to how to uh, make a hook, how to <laughs> tie a fly, how to uh, use different types of horse hair, dye different types of horse hair for different types of of water conditions. I mean, we're talking back in the 15th century. Right. And so. I I mean, she even talks about being conservation minded and not trespassing. I mean, all these different things. But you look at that and, and you know, originally I thought, oh, well, she just wrote this book because she was a nun and so she was bored. Right. And so she was of noble birth, so she didn't have to do a regular job. And so it must have just been something that she really liked. And that's why she um, wrote the book. But. If you look back in history in that time, you know, as a nun, in order for her to do an activity, it had to be sanctioned by the church. And in order for it to be sanctioned by the church, it ha- there had to be a document that the priest could bless. And that's the document. Oh, wow. Yeah. So interesting, right? <laughs> and there's a controversy around her as well, given that, you know, she's given all credit for for her book on Hawking, but then she's not given credit. They tried to take credit away from her and say that it wasn't her that wrote that book. But, um, you know, we already know that she has an, a successful book before this. And she talks about like ma- taking maggots and baking them in bread and sticking the, the bread underneath your skirt so that it will stay warm and the maggots <laughs> will stay, you know, healthy while Jeez. you go to the river. And I'm pretty sure you know, looking back in 15th century, if uh, a man actually wrote it, he wouldn't give credit to a woman. And I'm pretty sure that there weren't men who were putting stuff under their skirts at that time. So I'm pretty sure <laughs> that she wrote that book. Nice. So, you know, way back to the 15th century, here we have um, <clears throat> a woman who was out there enjoying our sport and writing about it. Right. So, mm-hmm. you know, when you see that, you think, oh, my goodness. Well, the first book written by a woman, obviously women have always been in this sport. But then we look at, you know, we move forward and you look at like, um, you know, today we use naturally natural fly patterns. Right. So yeah. something that will imitate match the hatch. So we say. But back in the day, they didn't. They used attractor patterns. Right. So um, they would just use like a red, a red little piece of thread on a hook and it would like attract the fish's attention and, the t- and it would like <laughs> give a strike and they would catch a fish that way. But. You know, back in the 1850s in actually America, here in Ralston, Pennsylvania, there was um, there's a famous little trout area called Lycoming Creek. And there was a woman who lived there, uh, Elizabeth Benjamin, and she spent her days, you know, watching all these anglers flock into her little area and fish and just going, you know, fishing and fishing and fishing. But they'd all bring like their European flies and everything that they or their flies from where they were right. as they traveled and they'd try to catch these fish and and, and they were very elusive trout in this little area and um so i guess she you know one day she just realized that the ta- the only person that was catching fish was the local tavern owner so she did what any self-respecting angler would do um she saw him heading down to the river and she snuck behind him and then she peered through the reeds to see <laughs> what he was doing and she realized that he was like catching fish, uh, catching bugs from on top of the water and looking at them. And then he would open his box and he would try to pick something out that looked the same. So she thought, oh, my goodness. Right. Wow. Look at what this guy is doing. So she went down that night. She got her husband and her son and they made like things that look like butterfly nets nowadays. And they ran down, you know, went down to the river where he was standing and they scooped up the bugs and they scooped up some of the flies that were on underneath the water and on top of the water. And she went back to her house and she tied flies that looked like those (laughs) bugs that she found in the river. So she's actually credited with um, being the first person to use a natural pattern. So, you know, when you go to match your hat, you can think, ah, guess what? The first woman that ever, the first person that ever did this was a woman. Her name was Elizabeth Benjamin, right? That's cool. And so it's things like that. I mean, our history just goes on and on and on and on and on like that. 
Um, and I don't know if you want me to just keep talking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, no, that's good. And, and I was thinking, it's what you said about the, the sneak. I just had um, Jerry French was on a kind of a different topic, but a same line. Uh, he tells the intruder story here, actually just came out here. And uh, man, it was funny because he talked about the story of, you know, that intruder back in the day when they were created. They were hiding it, right? They were hiding it from everybody. And uh, but, uh-huh. but, but people were literally, I mean, they had a few times people literally stole the fly right off of their rods while it was in their boats while they, while they're out fishing. Oh, my God. God, I know it was no like way. this. It was like this intense thing, but it, it kind of reminded me of that the sneaking around. But um, no, I mean, so so Elizabeth and I've I know I've heard Elizabeth Benjamin the name, and then also uh, Mary Orvis, uh, right? She's another big name. Can yeah. you put, uh, tell her story a little bit and how she fits in there? Sure. So Mary Orvis Marbury um, was 20 years old when she took over her dad's fly tying operations at CF Orvis Company. The, and all of us know Orvis nowadays, right? I yeah. mean, if you haven't cast the H3 rod, you need to, hmm. right? I used to think 15 years ago, I thought of Orvis as like a dog bed company, but they have huh. stepped their game in such a way. Was that your first thought when you first came into it? You're new to fly fishing. Did you think or that was it? You didn't think fly fishing? No, I didn't think fly fishing. I thought that they were a dog bed company um, that happened to sell fly rods and probably not very good ones, right? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's awesome. <laughs> um, and and it's it's funny now to think that they're like the champions of women in fly fishing and they make one of the best rods on the market, right? So, I mean, I've done a 180 in my thought from the beginning for sure in on Orvis and a lot of things. Um, but the world has changed in fly fishing over the last 15 years as well. But back in like 1876, I think it was when Mary Orvis was 20 years old, her dad, she took over the fly tying part of her dad's business. And did you know she has two older brothers and it is not the work of her older brothers that made Orvis what it is today. It's her work that did. And, um, and so what she did was when she took over the fly tying operation, she would, um, they would be sending flies, you know, let's say that they're sending, um, a, a Quill Gordon to someone on the West Coast and then they're sending a Quill Gordon to someone on the East Coast and she would get they would get letters saying, um, this is not the fly that I ordered. And so, I mean, today we don't think anything about the standardization of flies, but back in the day, people in different parts of the country would call the same fly different names. Mm. So what she did was she spent a lot of time, I mean, like years, and went out and talked to every single person, every single guide, every single angler that she could find and said, what do you call this fly? And so then she went back and she made these beautiful colored templates. And you, and if you can find one of her original books, they're worth a lot of money, hmm. one of the Mary Orvis Marbury um, books that have the different flies, the favorite flies and their histories, mm-hmm. that book was published in 1892. Anyways, if you can find, um, if you page through that book, you'll see her beautiful hand-drawn pictures of each different fly so that when someone on the East Coast ordered a Quill Gordon, they could go in the book and say, that's the fly I want. And she like solved all the problems of the disparity between flies. And so, you know, now today we open up a book. We're like, I want the Royal Wolf. There yeah. it is. I, I order it. It's exactly what we want. Mm-hmm. But back in the 1800s, they didn't have that. And so she saw a problem and then she solved it like any great entrepreneur would. Right. And so it is that work <laughs> and her work with that huge book and that all that um, uh, the background and the history and yep. sorting it all out and putting it all together in a fashion that we could all buy the same thing at the same time and know exactly what we're getting that made Orvis what it is today. Dang, that's so cool. And and now, so, and we could talk obviously a whole episode on or, on Mary, I'm sure, but um, I wanted to kind of keep it going. So if we, and I think back, you know, to, to my, I'm trying to, again, this is part of my whole master plan, right, of documenting some of the history where I can, but, you know, Joan Wolf was on, it was amazing, right? I had her on episode, mm-hmm. episode 100 and it was like a, a high point for me and everything. Um, but can you plug her? So where is so Joan Wolf? Obviously, she's a little later. But between Joan Wolf and Mary, is there any other people we should kind of maybe note there? Oh, well, there are so many. Like, yeah. for instance, I mean, even before that, Maria Ustensen, who was Queen Victoria's appointed rod maker. Did you know that back in the 1830s, there was uh, an appointed rod maker and it was a woman? Hmm. How there crazy is that, right? There you go. Um, Sarah Jane McBride is actually, if you take the temperature of uh, the water to know when a bug hatch is going to happen, you can attribute that to a woman named Sarah Jane McBride, who's from New York. 
And she mm-hmm. was a self-taught entomologist whose dad um, was a professional fly tire and prominent angler. And so after school, uh, she decided that she wasn't going to listen to her parents and that of society that said that after after school, a woman would go and get married and have a family. She took a year off and studied the waters in her backyard. And so we and discovered that um, the, the water temperatures affect bug hatches. Well, we know that now, but back in the day, we didn't, you know. In fact, <laughs> she's so she her work was so important in the um, 1870s that her writings, um, which were called Metaphysics of Fly Fishing, and it was published in Forest and Stream magazine, they are considered the first American papers of any consequence on the subject of aquatic insects from an angler's point of view. Oh, wow. wow Isn't that cool. amazing? That is right? cool. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. I mean... Uh, yeah, I mean, people so it seems you don't like, even know. But. Does it just keep, it sounds like it just keeps going on and on. Like, I mean, again, like, again, from a guy's perspective, you sit there and you, you read all these. It's it's almost like the history of, right, you hear the history from the people who, I don't know, it, right? It's bi- it's always biased kind of, right? Like the uh, Absolutely. And, and it's the same thing here where all these women. So, I mean, if somebody wanted to dig deeper into this, where, where would you tell somebody if they wanted to really find out more and maybe all the stuff you're talking about? Because I know we're going to leave a lot on the table. Yeah, you know, um, well, I've done an exhaustive history. It's taken me probably 10 years to put it all together. Oh, no kidding. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it, the information is out there if you put in enough time to find it. Yeah. But I'm always happy to talk to somebody okay. about the history of women. So, yeah. Cool. What, what about now? What about a book for you or something like that? Have a, do you have anything I, in line? Right. Yeah. N- I haven't yet. You know, I mean, I've been approached about it a couple of times, but yeah. You know, one magazine is enough to get out the door. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I know. Gosh, you're right. You got a you got a whole magazine. And, and the magazine, I mean, so you are. I, I think you're probably the largest uh, kind of women's you know focus magazine. Is there anybody out there that's kind of kind of doing some similar things on what you what you got going? Um, as far as a uh, woman's fishing magazine, we are the only one in existence. Uh-huh. Uh, there are a lot of women today. I mean, and we were going to talk a, a little bit about Joan Wolf, but today's yeah. ang- the female anglers that are out there, like for instance, Joan Wolf, um, obviously uh, a uh, <laughs> picking up a fly rod and casting 162 feet. I mean, are yeah. you kidding me? Who does that? You know, right. Joan Wolf does that. <laughs> um, you know, and, and so as we look at Joan Wolf, who is obviously such a phenomenal caster who has studied, I mean, and you interviewed her, you know, yeah. studied the pure physics of a, ca- of a fly rod. Um, knows exactly where those sweet spots are, knows exactly how to cast, all of that, just beautiful, and has been a a leader in our sport for, um, as far as women, giving us a foundation that we have for a long time. But if you look at Joan, and this is my own opinion um, coming from what I have studied, Mm -hmm. if you look at the history, you know, Joan came up in the world of the Mad Men, right? And so it was advertising. And so there are pictures of Joan out there that are very famous of her with pigtails blowing on a fly in short shorts and in a ball gown <laughs> casting. Right. And so, you know, you look at that and you think, wow, you know, back in the day advertising like that. But we look at the women who are in it today who get flack all the time online for wearing uh, a tank top or for putting stuff on Instagram when we have a whole culture that's grown up with a, a phone in their in their face. Right. The only way that they know that they that they, our young culture today knows that they're popular is by how many likes they get on Instagram, right. right? And so somehow, when we look back at our history, Joan, legitimate angler, legitimate caster, the best of the best, that's somehow overlooked, but we give the women today so much grief, and I just kind of always wonder, what's the difference, right? Yeah. No, it- <laughs> how are how was that, how was Joan legitimate but the anglers of today are not and i i think that's something we have to all think about like before we become a couch warrior and Mm -hmm. um blast people we see just by a picture online totally no that's such a great question and i think and you mentioned april i think april did talk to i'm I'm drawing a blank I'll, i'll put a link to the show notes but there is a um Oh, a, a person on, uh, she is on Instagram. She's a, a kind of a famous, you know, does fly. But she, yeah, she's wearing the bikinis and stuff. And I think she's, oh. you know who? Oh, it, let me tell you, it's Star Sizzle. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so you, uh, because yeah, Sizzle and I spoke about that. <laughs> oh, good, good. So I wanted to go down just for a sec because, I mean, I listened to that podcast. It's just, you know, and I and I didn't I didn't follow Dar Sizzle or anything. But, again, it was just interesting because for me, 
I, you know, I guess, you know, right, a guy's perspective, you, you see that and you think that you're like, oh, yeah, okay, you know, but so, but it's not. I mean, what, what's your take on, on that Darcizzle and, and, and all that stuff? Yeah. So, um, so I don't have any issue. And I said this on my podcast with April when we talked about this. I don't have any issue if a woman wants to fish in a bikini, if they want to fish in a tank top, if they want to fish in the full Orvis garb, right? I don't yeah. care. What I care about is that you're honest with what you're doing. And so my my issue with um, the Dar Sizzle uh, podcast was that she was trying to say and her boyfriend yeah. was trying to say that they weren't just photographing her and having her fish in a string bikini to get likes. But then at the same time, they were saying, but if I show a picture of her butt in a string bikini, I get thousands right. more likes and that makes me thousands of more dollars so i mean let's just call it like it is yeah so i don't have an issue if you want to do that but then just say that that's what you're doing or if you're fishing in a in a tank top or you're fishing in a string bikini you know that's fine but then recognize the fact that you're going to get catcalled at that yeah. as well and not be mad about it i mean it it's exactly. got to be you know i mean let's be just honest. be real with who we are that's my thing i just want people especially women in today's uh, day, you should be able to fish without makeup on and look your worst and not get flack for that. And you should be able to put on makeup if that's what you want and take a beautiful picture and not get flack for that either. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and like you said, I think just being honest is, is the, and, and you know, and in online, you know, this as well as anybody who's online or just out there in the world that you're going to have people that are, you know, the negative Nellies or, you know, people that are against, right, to say bad stuff and the trolls, all that. So it's just part right. of, you know, you're out there, you're going to have some of that. So, um, yep. Yeah. It just, it is what it, it's today's culture. And so I always say, you know, it's like my mom used to always tell me and everybody's mom used to tell me, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Right. Exactly. And if you don't like what, you know, like sometimes the people who, um, uh, we can get a lot of flack for even p taking a picture of a fish out of water, right? right? I mean, people will just complain about everything nowadays. And I am not advocating poor fish handling skills in any way. No. But what I'm saying is that if you have an issue with someone's picture, don't blast them outwardly no. online. Maybe send them a nice a nice message saying, hey, wow, that was a really nice fish. Did you ever think to maybe photograph your fish in the water? Or exactly, did you ever think that yep. maybe, you know, it, there is a better way to totally. do things, and I want to advocate for doing it in a better way. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think of so many things. I, my buddy uh, Dennis Isbister, who's got Wild Fish Wild Places, uh, the TV show. He he was telling me the story about how uh, I think it was on the podcast we did that he uh, he was up in Alaska and, and had a fish steelhead. He dropped it right, and the, and they filmed it, and it it wasn't a good you know it wasn't a good release and. And he yeah. put in there because he's real, right? He wants to show you that he's not perfect, and they're like, and, and that's how he does his his uh, his t his TV show. But God, he got railed for that, right? People oh. were just on him big time. Yeah, because obviously you know that if you work in fly fishing, we're all perfect, and we all have never ever held a fish or let fish <laughs> right. get away because fish aren't slippery in any way, right? And, exactly. And you know, and on and on top of that. We forget because we've been in the sport for so long and we're immersed in it. We forget that the vast majority of anglers out there are everyday yep. anglers who are doing this for fun, right? Exactly. So they are out there. They are excited about their fish. Maybe this is the, the first fish they ever caught. They have no idea how to hold a fish. They have no idea that proper fish handling skills even exist. The vast majority of people still eat fish and and I'm good with that, yeah. right? It is legal to catch and keep fish. Yeah. And I think sometimes we get on our high horse and we forget that not everybody is as educated or <laughs> has the same beliefs or, you know. And so I think just taking yeah. a step back, recognizing that all of us started at one time, heck. You know, Heather Hodson of United Women on the Fly, yeah. she says she says all the time, you know, we – I, there are pictures on my Instagram when I was a new angler. I didn't know how to hold a fish. Nope. Yeah, they're out there. That's okay. I was brand new. You know, now I know better. You know, when you know better, you do better, as Oprah says, right? <laughs> <laughs> nice, Oprah. I love it. Love it. Good. Well, let's uh, let's take it just, uh, you know, to kind of wrap this up a little bit on, on the, you know, obviously we just touched the surface on, on women and fly fishing. But so the 50-50, right, the Orvis thing, you, you noted that. That was a really cool thing they, they started up. I mean, how do you know how we're doing in the numbers? I mean, are we tracking that? Do we have any idea what the numbers look like? 
Uh, Orvis does track that. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to speak on that. Yeah. But I do know that women are still the largest growing demographic in fishing and in fly fishing. Oh, wow. Um, and, and I think that's because now women see other women online. So mm-hmm. we're talking about social media. This is a good thing. They see that women are out there, that they're having fun, that they're getting together with other women. There are things like the 50-50 Thing that's going on there's united women on the fly there's dunn magazine you know there's athena and artemis the woman's fly shop there's all these different avenues now that allow women to know that not only do they belong in the sport but they can see other women doing it and by seeing other women doing it they have a platform to be able to say ah this might be something that i might want to try as well so it's just a snowball effect right as more women get involved more women are excited about it women tend to be uh, they love to fish with their friends and they love to have these social things. So they bring more women into it. And I think that's where we're seeing it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Cool. Cool. Yeah. And I, I, I think it is, uh, I think you're right. I, I, again, a little, a short little snippet. I, we did a hosted trip uh, for steelhead and, um, and it was pretty cool because it was all people from the podcast that listen to this podcast that came in. We all met up. And, oh, cool. Yeah, it was amazing. And none of us knew each other, right? It was just like they all listened to the podcast. And I was like, hey, who wants to go steelhead fishing? And and one of the people that was like, uh, who was, I guess it was four guys and, and one and one uh, gal, right? And and she was amazing, right? And we were all, it, everybody was amazing. But we, we stayed in, in this cabin, you know, this house, and it was just this perfect thing. And you wouldn't have known at all, whether she was a male or female, you know what I mean? Like as far as her, I love it. you know what I mean? And it was, and it was the other cool thing was, so we're out there last, I think it was the last day in the river. We're coming out, we're pulling out the boat and, and another uh, lady there, she was putting in her boat and it turns yeah. out she was one of the big guides in that area up on the, uh, on the Olympic peninsula. And oh I, my gosh. I, I didn't know. I love it. I told her, I didn't know at the time, but it, they started talking. They knew each other from probably from United Women on the Fly, you know, and all that stuff. And I just sat there and I was kind of taking the boat and doing all that. It was just this cool boat. I was like, wow, that is, that is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So. I love it. It is, it is, fly fishing has a much different face nowadays as it, than it did 15 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Cool. Okay, well, um, hey, I, before we get out here, I did want to touch on just kind of, uh, you know, what you want. We talked about baby tarpon a little bit on the last episode. I just want to check in, you know, obviously you cover a lot in the magazine. What, what do you think is, a, is there a topic or a, a species or anything, a home water, or anything you want to touch on that you've been kind of excited about lately? Mm, wow. <laughs> That's a loaded question. Yeah. There's so much out there, right? Um, so Heather and I did uh, the Rippin' Hoppers road, Redfish Roadie. Mm-hmm. And so we did a lot of redfish tri- fishing through Florida and into uh, Louisiana. That was super fun. If no one has, you know, if you haven't yeah. redfished down in the marshes of Louisiana, you absolutely have to. Um, yep. My tarpon area in Mexico, um, in Tabasco, now has an outreach to go into some brand new water that they found where you can catch huge tarpon Mm -hmm. and permit and bonefish. So that's going to be fun experimenting with this next, uh, this next year, as soon as things start opening up. And, and, you know, I think one of the places that, uh, if you have one place that you could go to that's destination, um, it should be Oman because the fishing with Arabian fly fishers and Claire Carter, um, out of Oman is just spectacular. So you can catch, you know, three spot pompano, you can catch giant trevally, yellow permit, um, all these ridiculous fish. Um, it's not a cheap trip by any means, right. but if you're looking for exotic and you're looking for that once in a lifetime trip, that's where I would go. So that's cool. Yeah. And I love that you say that because we, you know, as I, like I said earlier, I'm over, you know, probably going to be at 200 episodes here in the short, um, you know, future, a lot of these things I've covered, right? And I'm trying to think of who the um, Oman, I had an episode of a person. I'm kind of With dro- Claire Carter? No, no, no. It was with somebody else. It was with a guy. And uh, but I get that. But we were talking about, the, it was it was Oman, right? We focused on Oman and we were talking about it. And, and he was just explaining, he lived over there for 20 years and fished it every day. And wow. he's got a Facebook or he's got a, you know, YouTube channel where he shows all the stuff. So, yeah, I mean, again, that's one of those things that's on my radar and, you know, there's no way I can get to all those places. I mean, what, how do you, how do you do it? Right. You've got all these places to get to, you know, you can't probably do it in your whole life. How, how do you uh, prioritize? Uh, I guess, you know, at this point, because I, well, 
now I don't have to travel at the moment, but before it was just like, okay, whoever calls first gets on the calendar first, right? Because, yeah. you know, whatever place I think of first is where I'm going to go. And then, you know, obviously as a small magazine, money is always an issue. So, you know, a trip to the Seychelles every year is not possible no. because it's just super expensive, even when you own a magazine. So, um, you know, I think for me, uh, I usually go to where the story tells the best woman's story. And so what's mm -hmm. going on with women in that industry at that moment in that area is where I usually go to. That's usually how it dictates. If, if you know, there's a giant first time gathering of a huge women's event in Casper, Wyoming, that's where I'm going, you know. Yeah, perfect. As an example. Perfect. Yeah, I just found it in it too. It was um, uh, episode 91, Ray Montoya, uh, DIY fly fishing in the Middle East. It was the, t oh, wow. the, the title. Yeah, so he, he's been doing it himself for a while and uh, – Pretty cool. So, and then hey, I want to go back to the redfish because I've had a couple of redfish, um, you know, focused episodes on here, but we haven't dug way into it. Can you, you know, before we get out here, you you guys kind of did the DIY thing, right? Was that with the road trip? Is that kind of how you did it? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Our road trips are always DIY, and uh, you know, redfish is a really great way to do DIY because you can do it on the down low. You can really, you know, if you want to spend a day and fish with a guide, you should. If you want to save your money and do that, you should because getting out, especially if you're going to fish in um, Louisiana, not so much Florida, but Louisiana, I mean, you want to take a boat ride that's a substantial boat ride way back into those marshes to get your big bulls. Yeah. Um, but Florida, you know, around the coast and everything, I mean, all those, those fish are coming up into the shallows at certain times of the water. I mean, you can see them rooting around in there. So doing it yourself that way is not a bad way. And the way that we do it is, um, you know, you get a bunch of your friends together and you get an Airbnb, which is super cheap. Mm -hmm. Once you split it, you know, five ways. And then you have time, you know, you do all your cooking in the, in the Airbnb and you go out once in a, once in a great while. And then you have your money for your guides. Right. Gotcha. So, I mean, at, it and it's always more fun to go with a group of people anyways than yeah. by yourself you know so i mean i'm really big proponent of the diy and mm -hmm. i'm also a very big proponent of when you're doing those trips on your own to go into your fly your local fly shop there meet the people that are there buy something from them before you ask for all the tips you know yeah. i mean that just shows that you're you're there for the right reasons i mean even if it's a couple flies yep. you know support your local that's it. That's it. Yeah. And, and we're, I'm hopefully getting a trip down to the Texas area. I think I'm going to take the family out. We're going to do, uh, I think we're going to do our first big road trip. Uh, well, not the first, but uh, the, uh, the biggest road trip with the girls and everything. If we're heading down that way, did you guys go through Texas at all? Oh yeah. I've yeah. spent a lot of time in Texas. In fact, Texas has one of the greatest group of women anglers. There are, they call them the Texas women fly fishers, the uh -huh. twiffers. They're amazing. <laughs> Yeah, cool. amazing. And so when you're on your way down there, you just let me know. I'll hook you up oh, with good. whatever you want to. Yeah, in whatever area you want to fish. This is going to be awesome. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show. Uh, we've got a couple other people we're hoping to meet up with on the way, too. I'm going to kind of do. I'm not sure if I'm going to podcast, but I'm going to get the get my girls out there and hopefully that they're they're casted pretty decently now so i'm, I'm hoping i'm not sure uh, and so for kids on redfish are they out there uh, could kids handle a redfish would be would that be a, a struggle uh it would be a struggle yeah right. <laughs> it's a struggle for a regular angler yeah, yeah they're really big strong fish yeah you know and they can be really picky but there are so many uh fish that in fish in the sea, as they yeah. say, you know, that when you're down there in salt water, even the smallest fish, you know, a lady fish is a giant endeavor for a, a, an ang a young, young angler and mm -hmm. super easy to catch, you know, just off the rocks, yeah, yeah. walk right out onto the rocks, cast a little, uh, pattern out there and twitch it back. Yep. You know, a little crab pattern or something would be perfect. So did you guys, uh, did you guys have some success out there for redfish? We did. So we actually had a whole bunch of we had we had four stops and we had women flying in and out at all the different stops and some women that went on our whole road trip with us. But um, the women on our trip caught redfish through Florida. Heather and I did not catch a redfish. We caught a bunch of other things, but we didn't catch a redfish until we got to Louisiana. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and the big joke was, we have got to catch a redfish on the redfish roadie. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, totally. So you got so you got what? what uh, do you remember what fly you got it on? Uh, I got it actually on what they call what it's a, um, uh, a fly that a friend of mine, Chris Seiss tied and he calls it the white claw and it's like a little, uh, crab pattern. Okay. Yeah. Crab. He tied it just for me. Yeah. And you can 
buy that fl- that fly from him. I mean, it works like a charm. Does it? He's actually a fly tire from Not the Real World. Yeah, Chris Seitz from Not the Real World. Great fly tire. Cool. Cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll put a link out to, to him as well. Uh, what about what about a tip? If you could think of a tip that somebody, if they were going for redfish, anything, you know, come to mind if they're getting their fur. I mean, how'd you get how'd you get yeah. yours? If you if you're gonna go fish for redfish, you need to recognize that it is super windy down there. Mm. No matter what the time, it is sight fishing, and so you're it's like you're on the flats boat, but it's a kind of a. Uh, um, a muddy bottom. So you're only going to see like tails and you're going to have to really listen to your guide. So if you're going to go into the marshes, you're going to want a a guide that's really good. And you're going to want to know how to double haul because if you don't have a strong cast in the wind, it's going to be a challenge. I'm not saying that you can't do it. I'm just saying that it's a challenge. So Mm -hmm. before you go red fishing in a place like the marshes where it's going to be the vast majority of the time windy, practice up on your casting and listen to your guide because he will say, do you see it over there? You know, 50 feet coming at you, coming at you. And, and you know what? Honestly, I was redfish blind to begin with. Yeah. And I could not see them. <laughs> I mean, and but it takes a little bit of time. You know, after an hour or so of doing this, two hours or so, you can see it. But in that first couple hours, your guide is your best friend. Whatever he says, if he says more left, do more left. It doesn't yeah. matter if you can see him. Just put it where he's telling you. Perfect. Okay, and and then on uh, you know on the I was just thinking we talked about Joan Wolf um, just before we get out of here with uh, any new names out there. I, I know there's a couple in our area. Some there, there's a couple people, but anybody we should keep a lookout that are doing some good things out there that you see or you've highlighted. Absolutely. So um, there is Maxine McCormick, yep. who is now the grand champion of casting, right? I mean, you want to keep an eye on her. You want to keep an eye on a young girl named uh, Stevie Kim Rubel who uh, has already caught the Grand Slam. And I mean, I think she caught it by the time she was 11 or something (laughs) like that. She's a crazy good angler. Um, uh, You know, there's a whole group out there called Fly Girl Global that was just started by uh, one of the girls who wrote an article for us in our magazine. She's a young girl. Um, We call her Lil D. (laughs) And, uh, you know, her. if you want to follow her Instagram, it's March Brown Eye Done. Mm -hmm. And she just started this thing where she gets online during the pandemic. She gets online and she ties with other young girls in all over the United States and all over the world. And so it's been really fun to see her start Fly Girl Global through this whole thing. And I think that's what that's what it's all about. That's what you're going to see a lot more of. And I think so. For me, those are three young up and coming girls that you'll want to keep an eye out for because they're going to do great things that's amazing yeah i again i, I keep talking about my girls because it's obviously my focus but they're they're six and eight they're turning a six and eight here in, a, in like a couple weeks and man they're into fly tying right they're both into fly tying now and i've been doing, oh my goodness i know so this have thing have them watch her. exactly yes, she, should, she should jump on it'll be perfect for her this is amazing for they're, them. they're gonna be yeah. excited and we're getting ready for the uh, salmon fly hatch so, so she tied her first salmon fly uh juna did and uh and it was like okay Okay, this thing is definitely going to oh, catch a fish. My gosh, I love it. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, send us some photos our way so we can put it out there. Yeah, I will. We'll, to yeah. Show when, that. When we get back, we'll, we'll send you some pics and everything. So, uh, okay, Jen, well, you know, again, I, I could talk to you forever here, but um, I'll let you kind of respect your time a little bit, let you get out of here. Anything else before, you know, we get out of here? Maybe in the next, uh, you know, kind of six months or two. I know it's a crazy time, but anything you want to give a highlight, anything coming up? Um, well, if all things go well, we do have uh, a couple events that are going on, one in the Smoky Mountains, uh, one in Atlanta, and then uh, we did talk about an east eastern uh, trip for uh, Rip and Hopper, but I'm uh-huh. not sure that's going to happen. We are kind of on hold at the moment, but um, you can always check our website. And uh, there's always something going on. United Women on the Fly as well. Always a great place if you're a, a woman, you have girls, you want to get in touch with other people to fish with. That's a great platform. And thank you for raising your daughters in Fly. That really yeah. means a lot, you know. Totally. Um, when I was growing up, you didn't really think about taking your daughters oh, right. uh, fishing. So I always appreciate a dad who has yep. the foresight to do that. That's cool. Yeah, it was funny because again, I, I'm a guy, right? So I remember when I first realized, okay, we're ha- I'm going to have a kid. You know, it's that thing like, okay, I always thought passing down the name and like having a boy, right? That whole thing. Uh-huh. But as soon yeah. as my, you know, as soon as my first kid was born and she was there, it was like, it was that was so far not even a thought in my mind. You know what I mean? It's amazing, right? And I just realized, like, dude, th- it doesn't matter whether it's a boy or a girl, right? This is amazing. Right. So. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, it's funny. My oldest daughter just turned 30 last week. And so I, when she, I was pregnant with her, there was a nurse at the hospital and she said to me, you know, when I was pregnant, you know, having a child is like allowing your heart to walk around on the outside of your body. Oh, wow. And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then <laughs> it's been 30 years and it's true. Dang, that <laughs> no is... matter all every day for those 30 years, a little piece of you is walking around out there no matter where they are, or how old they get. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, that is. A, I love that, Jen. Thanks for uh, leaving us with that. That is perfect. So uh, DunMagazine.com is the best place in the, in the uh, I'll, I'll put a link out to that. I uh, just want to thank you for coming on again, Jen. You're my, I think, only my second uh, returning guest, may, maybe maybe third, but this is, uh, this is pretty awesome, so I'm glad you were able to come back on. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. All right. See you later. Bye. All right. Take care. Bye. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all the links we cover, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 146. It would be truly amazing if you could take a second and check out the new Outdoors Online Marketing Podcast. I'm helping small companies grow their online influence and uh, and with, have a focus on fly fishing companies. But uh, if you have one or know someone, please head over to outdoorsonline.co slash podcast and, uh, and help share the message. Have a listen. Let me know what you think. Thanks again for stopping by today to check out the show. I'm looking forward to catching up soon. Hope to maybe see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.